Hello, I'm Graham Fitch and welcome to March Practice Clinic where I address questions sent in in advance by Online Academy subscribers that usually relate to practicing as opposed to technique, but of course the two things do overlap. And in the first question from Gillian, um, which relates to the Blue Danube arranged by Ernest Haywood, um, not sure how easy this is to find, but it's, it's nowhere near as, as difficult as the Schultz Abler famous warhorse. But it does start off with a tremolo, um, and Gillian is asking for help with the tremolo. Sometimes with tremolos, we have to be really precise with the number of notes we put in. Um, I'm thinking of something like the pathetic opening. We've got to be very measured with that tremolo. Other times, we can be a bit freer. Um, and I don't think with a tremolo, in this particular tremolo, it's really just describing a kind of shimmer. Maybe it's the haze on the, the water. Um, maybe it's the, the twinkly stars. Who knows what it is, but it's something kind of magical. So what I've got is a time signature of 6-8. And I'm going to aim to play groups of four. One, two, three, four, times six. Two, three. So you can hear there, hopefully, because I was doing it rather clearly, you can hear the groupings. So how would you uh, get that working in your hand? The thing with the tremolo, um, because you, we're dealing with repeated notes, we want to keep inside the key. So the first thing would be not to lift the key all the way up to the top. So you could practice that by perhaps holding on to the thumb first, put the whole chord down, the triad down, and then repeat the upper pair and see if you can keep inside the key. Now, as with all repetitions, when we're dealing with repeated notes, we want to avoid thinking too much down um, vertically, but to add a little bit of a horizontal element to that. So I don't know if you can see, it's a very tiny movement. It's almost as though I'm rising and falling in my wrist. And that keeps me free. If I, if I lock my hand, then I've got to use my fingers and it all gets very tight and uncoordinated. So I am using also a little bit of a rotational movement between the 4-2 the, the fingering and the thumb fingering. But um, it's not really very visible because, because I'm aiming to stay inside my key. But you could practice it as well with bigger movements and then reduce those movements until you can just sense that there's a little kind of trembling going on in the hand. It's also useful to practice the second finger to the thumb and the fourth finger to the thumb, assuming you're using the fourth finger. You could use five and three, but I would probably want to use four and two. And then when it comes to the um, putting together with the left hand, I would recommend holding onto the thumb in the practice and just practicing with the top pair. So given that we've got four notes for each group, it's going to come out like this. One, two, three, four. That would be a very good way to, to, to build in some sort of structure, rhythmical structure to the right hand. But in the end, be very, very light and don't be too concerned if, if the notes, you know, if you end up doing sometimes that instead of that. As long as you get the, the general impression of, of a kind of haziness in your sound um, and focus, of course, on the left hand, which is where all the music is. So the meat of the matter is in the left hand, the right hand's just providing that, that background, and, and keep it in the background. Don't be too concerned with um, absolute rhythmical precision in the, in the performance, but in the practicing, you probably would want to. Sheila asks a question about Liszt's romance in E minor. Um, 
she says here, everything is going well until the second section in bar 38, when the left-hand arpeggios from the first section turn into triplets, which means they are played much faster. Can you advise as to the best way to practice to get them up to speed smoothly and evenly, please? Uh, right, so we've got here a left-hand uh, triplet figure, which is pretty mobile, and changes from bar to bar. First of all, I need to get a good fingering for that. Now, I've got a, an addition that um, suggests 5, 3, 2, 1, and then 4, 2, 1. The editor leaves out the fingering in the last part of the bar because, you know, maybe they're expecting you would just do 4, 2, 1 again, 2, 4, but you could equally put a thumb at the end, which would shorten the, the jump. So that's something to consider. Um, as I was noodling with this, I found that the 5, 3, 2, 1 fingering was fine for my hand, but might not suit every hand, because there's a little bit of a stretch there between the 5 and the 3, uh, and then the 3 to the 2. So you could experiment with doing this fingering 5, 2, 1, 2, and then shifting, and either ending the bar with a 4 or a thumb. So that would give you this. And of course the pedal for the whole bar. I wouldn't change pedal in the second bar either. It's the same harmony. You don't need to change pedal in the second bar. Uh, that would be bar 41. So if I show you bar 41 left hand fingering, I would recommend simplest fingering. Five, two, one, four. Obviously the same in the next bar. So getting back to Sheila's question about how would you build in speed to that, I think the first thing to do is to, to notice that if the arm, if the elbow is in a low position, then that shift is, is further to get to. But if your elbow would be a little higher, then you can more easily pivot over the thumb to, to get to the fourth finger on the G. And you might notice when I do that, I'm adding a little rotational movement over my thumb. If I do that in slow motion, exaggerating it, do you notice that's much too big of a movement? But I'm not lifting and then dropping because that would take too long and would create an accent where we don't want it. So if your hand is big enough, you can practice the pivot around the thumb See what I'm doing there? I'm playing two, one, four, one, two, one, four, one. I've kind of isolated the, the pivot. And I'm just making sure that my elbow is in one spot as I pivot over the thumb. I'm not dropping my elbow. And then you've got another pivot, depending on which fingering you use. Let's say, um, looking at bar 41, you've got that pivot as well over to the top. So practice the same way, practice around the thumb. And you'll, you won't be able to manage that if there's any tension or tightness in your wrist. So loosen the wrist. Um, and do you notice there that the arm is gliding across the keyboard? I've got the pivots going on. I've got the rotations going on. When you come to bar 43, a similar situation. You've got a big hand position here. So bar 43 would need to be organized differently because I've got to put my thumb on the black key here. Now I want to come out here on the two. Do you notice? Let me do that again. Two. Change to a four and then go back in for the for the F sharp. So my choreography is from out to in, back out, in. And you may think, well, why would I need to make those Big, big movements, surely that's going to take time. Well, I'd, pr I'd prefer that than have to play in a cramped position here in the black key area with my uh, twos and fours. That would cause me tension and the tension would cause me to tighten up. So the movements, as long as they're free, I can do them faster. The 
there's no problem with speed there at all. Uh, quite the reverse. Bar 46, 5, 1, 3, 1, th I think is better. And again there, pivot over the thumb. Do you see that rotation? And then change to a 3, in for the black key. What I'm doing is, is giving a little bit of shape in the left hand to the top, the rise and the fall of the left hand. I'm absolutely holding the pedal for at least one bar. Um, as I say, you could, if you wanted to keep the pedal for between bars 40 and 41, that would work. Um, obviously, we'd need to change in 43 and 44, but that would be the general principle. So organize the fingering, organize the movements, and uh, be very patient uh, by practicing left hand quite a bit by itself with your pedal. Angeles says, I was wondering if you could help me by providing some pointers on how to tackle Scriabin Prelude number four, opus 11, number one. Um, Angeles is not quite sure about the fingering for the left hand. Various other questions there uh, that I'll let me see if I can address in a just a, a brief kind of walkthrough here. So we're talking about a very magical piece of music, this. It, the, you've got a, a kind of a melody in the left hand at the beginning. It's not just the left hand that's melodic. We've got fragments of melody in the top as well. <laughs> top right hand. And this three note idea, this falling three note is from the beginning as well, isn't it? So you've got a melodic line that's kind of divided up between the, the left hand and the top right hand with as though tolling bells in the middle. You've got that repeated B, sometimes with other notes, which is the background, kind of funereal, or at least uh, rather sad. So really, really lean into that pinky in the right hand. Scriabin's even notated it in the second bar with a separate stem for the melodic line on the top, marked with portato markings, staccato dots with the slur, which we play, I would play those with separate wrist movements. Can you see how I'm hinging down? If we just saw a legato, we might just play like this without the staccato dots, but I want to somehow break the legato, uh, add a little intensity to that. And then the left hand again, the same kind of idea, but uh, a little lower down. So we have to really be attentive to the voicing in the right hand. Um, let me go back to bar number one, and I'm going to give you a practice suggestion that I like to do for myself, and I, I recommend to my students. And that's to take, say, the right hand part and divide it up between the two hands. I'll show you. Because it's much easier for me to create my sound this way. I can really let my top, my right hand in that instance, sing out. And then when I play just with my right hand, I'm aiming to replicate the sounds that I created with two hands. And there's all sorts of other voicing exercises we can practice, such as playing the melodic line by itself and shadowing the underneath notes. You can see I'm touching the keys, not sounding the notes. And other suggestions could involve, let me just take the last two chords just playing twice the upper note with a nice juicy tenuto on the top. 
I could practice this as well. You notice what I'm doing there? I'm playing the melody note ahead of the background. And then I'm going to see if I can get that a little quicker. And now I'm going to see if I can synchronise. It takes a little bit of practice, but after a while you'll get very good at that if you aim for it. So if we dip down to the fourth bar, actually the, toward the end of the fourth bar. Um, okay, let me just play from the C sharp. Again, top right hand, kind of sobbing and sighing. That's just straight legato. Sing it. Sing the, play the line and sing it. It's a nice long phrase, isn't it, in the right hand there. The left hand, what's going on in the left hand? I would use a second finger here on the E. Now there is something in the left hand of uh, the seventh. So if you feel the size of that interval, but don't bring that left thumb out too much because we want to kind of keep the, the top. We want to keep that uh, relatively clear. that I'm adding a little bit of rubato here just because it's a melodic line it's a kind of harmonic melody isn't it here so the way I'm organizing that metrically is uh, let me just see if I can do that for you I feel the unit starts here and another unit here I think you can hear how generous I'm being on the top there with my melodic line. Perhaps also this way of practicing. I'm just playing twice the underneath. And again, aiming to create a different sound, a thinner sound from my lower notes. I could practice just my lower notes by themselves. Right. We could also practice playing the top note twice, but with a tenuto quality. And that will really open up and warm up your sound. If I play it too straight, it's just going to sound too vertical. I want a horizontal effect there. I'll show you. This is too straight. You know? no direction to that line, even though my sound is good. But the basic quality of the sound was, was good, but it, it just needs forwards. Open it up. Take your time. And again, notice here, we've got two new toes over those notes or under them in the left hand. How am I going to create that sound? By dropping through my wrist. Just use a bit of arm weight through here. And create a, a contrast there. We've got a pianissimo. shape in, in that line as well. Um, I hope that gives you some ideas on, on how you might approach this piece. 
and Cindy finally it, with the Funeral March uh, Chopin Sonata, the third movement. Uh, Cindy's saying that she has difficulty coordinating the huge chords in the right hand with the left hand ornaments. Uh, kindly advise some simple exercises to practice. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't think it's a question of simple exercises to practice. I think it's a question of just knowing. The, the way that Chopin notates is in the... He expects the execution of his ornaments to be in the classical tradition, meaning on the beat. So if I go straight to that bar, we've got little grace notes. Let me play from the, from the upbeat. Let's see if I can... Um... <laughs> This piece I think. So what I do if I slow that down I like to swing in to the F with my second finger and then change to my thumb. Now here put the G in the left hand together with together with my right hand. For practice purposes it is quite useful to measure out trills. Decide how many notes you're going to play. I would do a variety. So maybe let's start off with 16th notes. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Okay, now let me try sixes. We don't want to spell it out nearly as much as that, of course, but just for practice, let me try now eights. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what I often find is by practicing a bunch of different measured trills, I can kind of let that happen as it will in a performance. We're wanting a kind of rumble of timpani up with it. Right, so I, I think that would probably do the job for you. In terms of how we would play it mechanically, again, use a rotational trill. I would do three, two, one, two. Don't do it from the fingers. Do it from the arm, from the forearm. It's much freer, much freer that way. Um, that brings us to the end of the, the practice clinic for this month. So. If you're an online academy subscriber, do send us in your questions. If you're not yet a subscriber, look down in the description and join us. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for watching.